AMD finally launched their brand new graphics cards, the AMD Radeon RX 7900 XT and the RX 7900 XTX, which is the card I'll be talking about today. So it is pretty much the most anticipated GPU of the year, especially since Nvidia launched their very expensive 4000 series cards. And there has been a ton of hype leading up to this moment because AMD promised similar performance for a lot less money. So let's look at the card itself, let's see how it performs in 26 different games on three different resolutions and how it performs when it comes to thermals, noise and power consumption. Let's begin. This video is brought to you by Corsair and their brand new Dominator Platinum RGB memory. These super fast DDR5 6000Hz memory kits are specifically made for Ryzen 7000 series CPUs. They feature a stylish aluminum heat spreader with DHX technology that keeps them nice and cool under load, offering a smooth and stable performance with a lot of room for overclocking. And they come with 12 customizable Capellix LEDs that you can control with their IQ software and easily sync up with your other Corsair components. Check them out using the links in the description below. The reference RX 7900 XTX is probably the most reasonable looking GPU that came out recently. Every single 4080 and 4090 have been extremely oversized, while this design is a lot more practical. I wouldn't really call it small, as it is 29 centimeters long, about 12 centimeters deep, and two and a half slots thick. So it is definitely large enough to look impressive in a bigger case, while still being able to fit in a lot of smaller cases as well. It is surprisingly dense for its size with a weight of 1.8 kilos, which is as much as some of the larger 4080s. So it feels really heavy and really solid and it definitely gives the impression of a high quality build. AMD is sticking to the traditional two 8-pin power connectors, uh, avoiding the discussion Nvidia had with the new 12-volt uh, high power connector and the adapter. And in terms of connections, you get one HDMI 2.1 connector, one USB Type-C connector with DisplayPort 2.1 support and two DisplayPort 2.1 connections, which is very interesting because these connections will allow high-end monitors of the future to show their full potential if 480 Hz on 4K resolution ever becomes a thing. Looking at the specs, the 7900 XTX and the slightly cheaper XT, which unfortunately I didn't get this time, have more cores, higher clock speeds, more memory and a larger memory bus than the 6900 XT from the last generation. They also come with a slightly higher TDP, which obviously suggests slightly higher power consumption. But between these two cards, it kind of does make sense that AMD wants to focus on this uh, XTX. The difference in price is about 10%, but as you can see here, the gap in specs is significantly bigger than that. So I've tested this RX 7900 XT against its predecessor, the 6900 XT, uh, Nvidia's latest 4090 and 4080 cards, as well as the 3080 and 3090. And as always, if you're interested in the full spec of my test bench, I will leave it in the description of this video so you can go ahead and check it out. Anyhow, starting with the latest Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 2, AMD is off to a great start. With 169 FPS average at 4K resolution and 257 FPS average at 1440p, it will get the most out of high refresh rate monitors and it is actually comfortably ahead of the 4080, even approaching the 4090. That goes both for average FPS and 1% lows, which you can see in the brackets. At 1080p, it even just beats the 4090, which is a very impressive result. God of War shows a similar story. It beats the 4080, it is not too far from a 4090, and most importantly, it runs it really well on high resolution and high refresh rate monitors. In Troy Total War, the 7900 XTX beat the 4090 at 1440p and the RTX 4080 at all three resolutions. Borderlands 3 is another title where AMD does really well, beating the 4080 at all three resolutions, although this time around the 4090 is further ahead. Plague Tale Requiem is quite heavy on the GPU, but once again the AMD card did really well. With a good gameplay experience at every resolution, it was beating the 4080, which is a bit surprising as this was one of the first games to actually include support for Nvidia's DLSS 3, so I kinda expected Nvidia to win 
this one. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, on the other hand, is an AMD-sponsored title, so it wasn't that surprising that 7900 XTX did well here, once again beating the 4080 by a couple of frames. Control is another NVIDIA title, but the new AMD card did well here too. It is still a hard game to run, but at 82 FPS at 4K resolution, it was perfectly playable. It does just beat the 4080, but since this game only supports DLSS and not FSR or any other, upscaler, a 4080 with DLSS will do better here. CSGO results have been a bit of a mess with the latest CPUs and GPUs, resulting in some very inconsistent performance differences between these high-end cards, with the 6900 XT doing really well, for example. Technically, the 4090 is the best card here with the most consistent 1% lows, but realistically, any GPU will run this game at any resolution easily. Watch Dogs Legion has the XTX just ahead of the 4080, although, once again, most of these GPUs would be more than enough, even at 4K resolution. And the same goes for the Shadow of the Tomb Raider. The XTX is just ahead of the 4080, where it counts, but it is all pretty close. Far Cry 6 is another big win for AMD, beating the 4080 at all resolutions and staying close to the 4090. In Spider-Man Remastered, the 4080 and the 7900 XTX were pretty close, with both of them offering a good experience on all three resolutions, and Dying Light 2 has both of those cards pretty close as well, but AMD looks slightly better with higher 1% lows across all resolutions. But while these results are really strong compared to the latest NVIDIA cards, uh, that's not the case for every game. Anno 1800, for example, has the 4080 leading by a few frames at 4K, although in a slow game like this one, that doesn't really matter. Uh, World War Z has the 7900 XTX competing with the 4080 at 4K, but losing by a bit at lower resolutions. Cyberpunk 2077 is a little bit closer, though I would say that Nvidia has a slight advantage here with the 1% lows. The 7900 XTX easily handles this game at any resolution, which couldn't be said for the 6900 XT, which struggled to hit 60 FPS without dropping the graphics quality. Doom Eternal is a game that shows great scaling with GPU power at all resolutions, with the latest three cards well ahead of the last generation cards. And here the 4080 does beat the XTX by a little bit, but with these frame rates, again, this doesn't really matter. And we can say the same for Division 2. They are all fine, but the 4080 is just ahead. In Rainbow Six Siege, the XTX has slightly better 1% lows, a slightly worse average FPS, but ultimately it doesn't matter much until 4K 360Hz monitors become a thing. Outriders is another NVIDIA title with ray tracing and upscaling support on NVIDIA GPUs only, and you can see how well that cooperation did in this title. The 4080 is comfortably ahead, uh, even without DLSS, with a big gain in 1% low specifically, which you can notice when playing at 4K as well as 1440p. The XTX is still completely fine, of course, and I suspect that if this game had actually been a bigger success, they would have paid more attention to it. Now, Wolfenstein Youngblood is another example of a game that will basically run easily on any recent GPU, but the XTX is behind the 4080 here, so there are clearly games that favor Nvidia and games that simply favor AMD, but there are also games that were behaving a bit oddly. In Assassin's Creed Odyssey, for example, the XTX looked really strong at 4K, where it beats the 4080 and almost reaches the 4090, but at 1440p and 1080p, it didn't get much higher than 160 FPS, which is similar to the 6900 XT. 160 FPS is completely fine, but it is still strange to see this result. Gotham Knights was also a bit of a mess. At 4K, the AMD card looks okay, but at 1440p, it was suddenly behind the 3080 and the 6900 XT, and at 1080p, it somehow showed even worse numbers. And also, there were regular stutters present in the game. Now, this game is a total technical mess on any hardware, but it seems to affect AMD a bit more than others, and it's just not great to have a brand new $1,000 GPU running a brand new game poorly, and I really do hope they can look into it and fix these games with a future driver update. 
Tiny Tina's Wonderland was interesting because the 4080 was comfortably ahead of the 7900 XT, but in Borderlands 3, which comes from the same developer and uses the same engine and it has yeah, pretty similar graphics overall, AMD was ahead. And this is a pretty big gap, so again, I think maybe a driver update might fix this problem. In Dirt 5, on high settings with some limited ray tracing added, the 7900 XTX does seem okay in terms of average FPS, but it is quite far behind the 4080 in terms of 1% lows, especially on lower resolutions. And I don't think ray tracing is causing the issue here, since the 6900 XT and other last generation cards do better here. And Formula 1 2022 kind of confirms that. On ultra high settings, which also includes some ray tracing effects, the 7900 XTX was looking much better than the 6900 XT, almost doubling the FPS on higher resolutions. The 4080 is still better, but at least it's a big step from the last generation. Compared to the 6900 XT, the 7900 XTX is actually a lot faster in a ton of games, even on 1080p where the CPU is often considered a bottleneck. In 11 out of 26 titles, it is ahead by 25% or more. If you currently own a 6900 XT and a 1080p monitor, I wouldn't really suggest upgrading, but 20% average FPS increase is a good generational improvement. On 1440p, the gap grows to 32% on average. In 18 games, the 7900 XTX was faster by 25% or more, and aside from that buggy Gotham Knights, it was a pretty consistent step forward. On 4K, we're looking at an average FPS increase of about 45%, with only CSGO behaving a bit odd, but the other 25 titles were showing a gain of at least 25%, sometimes almost doubling the FPS, like in Formula 1 2022. And 45% overall is again a great generational improvement. If I compare it to the RTX 4080, things do get a little bit more interesting. On 1080p resolution, exactly half of the games favor NVIDIA and the other half favors AMD. NVIDIA has a slightly bigger lead with a gap of 10% or more in eight titles, while AMD is ahead by 10% or more in six games, but the average difference between the two is about 2% in favor of NVIDIA, which is close to irrelevant. On 1440p, the difference between these two cards comes down to zero. Uh, NVIDIA is ahead in 13 games and AMD is ahead in 12 games, but the gap with which AMD wins is now bigger in some of the titles. Three games actually showed a win of 20% or more, while Nvidia made that happen in one single game, and a big win in Call of Duty is more valuable than winning in Outriders. But at 4K resolution, the 7900 XTX pulls ahead of the 4080. It is now ahead in 16 games, with 9 of them showing a gap of 10% or more, while Nvidia again takes a 10% lead in one single title. Here, the average difference between the two is about 5% in favor of AMD. As expected, the XTX cannot really compete with the 4090, which is another 20% ahead on 1440p and 28% on 4K resolution. Now, the 4090 has a price tag that is 60% higher, so it's not really fair to compare these two, but it does mean that people that just want the best card out there, no matter the price, will still go for Nvidia. Now, I also want to talk about ray tracing a little bit, because this is something that Nvidia is mentioning and pushing all the time, but AMD has also been bringing it up lately. A lot of games have been adding this feature, and I still think that AMD is at a slight disadvantage here. Uh, Real-time ray tracing is really hard on the GPU and you basically need upscaling to make it viable at high resolutions. And as I mentioned before, some games like Control or Watch Dogs Legion uh, only supports DLSS and not AMD's FSR upscaling, which means that ray tracing might not be usable in these games if you have an AMD card. On the other hand, in titles that do support uh, both ray tracing and FSR, like Dying Light 2, like Spider-Man Remastered, like Cyberpunk 2077, it is actually perfectly doable with an AMD card. And even though the RTX cards are still the stronger option, AMD has definitely reached the point where this is a feature that you can actually play around with, which really wasn't the case with the 6900 XT. So I really think that AMD has improved their ray tracing game by a lot. 
When it comes to power consumption, AMD did really well in recent years, but Nvidia is now using a more advanced production process and that kind of shows in power consumption. The XTX has a TDP of 355 watts and the 4080 has a TDP of 320 watts, but in gaming, the difference between them is generally closer to 50 to 70 watts, which is a significant difference for a roughly similar performance. I know some of you don't care about power consumption, but if you're paying close to one euro per kilowatt hour, like I do here in the Netherlands, and if you game about two hours per day, you could pay around 50 euros more per year if you run the XTX instead of the 4080, and even more if you play more than two hours per day. So that is definitely something to think about. Now, more power also means more heat, which requires more cooling. And this reference card held up pretty well, even though it's not that big for a 350 plus watt card. Core thermals were around 60 degrees on average with a hotspot of around 80 degrees, which is perfectly fine and way below AMD's own 100 plus degree threshold. Noise level was at 43.6 decibels at a 50 centimeter distance, which is louder than I would like it to be, but it's not that bad given the size of this card. I do expect bigger partner cards to be quieter. Now, unfortunately, my sample here did have some coil wine in some games and some situations. Ah, it wasn't really horrible, but it was definitely more than noticeable at times. And I also checked with two other reviewers that had the same card and they also had the same issue as we did. Now, Coil wine is sample specific and maybe we were all just unlucky and some others will not have this issue, but I thought it was just fair to mention it, especially since there are more cases of it. Overall, I think AMD has done a great job with the RX 7900 XTX. It is a big upgrade over the 6900 XT and most importantly, it is a car that can play any game at high settings at high resolutions without any problems. At 4K, there's a few games that sit a little bit closer to 60 FPS than I would like, but for the majority, some form of upscaling can improve that. So it really is a perfectly capable GPU for high refresh rate 4K and 1440p monitors. If you were considering to spend 700 to 800 dollars on a 6900 XT or a 3080, this is a way better alternative. With an MSRP of $999, it seems more reasonable than the $1,200 4080. In my 4080 review, I kind of mentioned that it would be a great card if it was under $1,000, and that is exactly what AMD is doing here. In the EU, the MSRP is €1,160 Euros for the XTX, uh, while the cheapest RTX 4080s will cost you €250 Euros more, and that is a big price gap. But if you have to choose between these two cards, I would say Nvidia's DLSS is in a better spot than FSR right now. Um, Nvidia is more expensive, but the higher power consumption of the XTX can easily close that price gap by a bit over a year or so in some regions like the Netherlands, for example, or they can even make it more expensive if you game a lot per day. Now, the XTX is physically smaller and it will fit in smaller cases as well, while every 4080 so far has been massive. And when it comes to rasterization performance, the XTX is slightly ahead. Now, it is very important to remember that some games simply prefer AMD and some games prefer Nvidia. And in 26 games I've tested, the difference between the two cards is 5% in favor of AMD. But if you had a different set of games, that percentage would be completely different. So please take it uh, with a grain of salt. Still, I think AMD could have done much better in some games and that the performance can and should improve even more with future driver updates, which is also kind of a bit of an AMD thing. Uh, that feeling that it does great, but that it can do even better with more cooperation with game developers and just with covering more ground in general. Uh, it also has more memory, which might be important in the future, but it is not so relevant at the moment. On the other hand, 4080 is available at MSRP and AMD still kind of needs to show that they have enough stock and that the prices will stay low, especially since this launch had so much hype around it and that is a great recipe for scalping and for inflated prices. And AMD really needs to make sure they keep that price advantage for all this to kind of make sense. At the end of the day, you will need to decide what matters to you because I don't really think there is one right answer here, at least uh, not until we see some actual stock and we see some real prices instead of 
MSRPs. Uh, if you care about RTX, the lower power consumption or some other feature that Nvidia offers, and you're willing to pay more, that is completely fine. But if you care about the form factor, the uh, raw performance, uh, you simply prefer AMD, or you just don't want to spend more than $1,000 on a card, and they're actually selling for that much, this should be a fantastic option. Now that is all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it ended up being a pretty long one, but if you liked it and you want to see more videos like this one, do consider clicking that subscribe button. Bye all and see you in the next one. Bye.